Welcome to Regrade Request, where two college professors take a second look at questions and answers from around the internet, and from you, the listener, and possibly from some robots. My name is Professor Will McBurney. And my name is Professor Mark Sheriff Robots? We'll get Wait, there. what? We'll get there. We'll get there? We'll get there. Are you, are, like Skynet? Like, eventually we'll get there, and the Skynet will take over, and the robots will be doing the entire podcast and all of our lessons for us? Uh, I think... I think by the time we get to that segment, you might lose some faith in Skynet. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, well, there's a way to start. We're going to have some robot guests, apparently. But before we get into that, oh my gosh, Will, we're going to dive into one of the deepest, darkest corners of the internet. A place where there is no light, where there is no hope. We're going to academic Twitter. Oh, I thought we were going to just normal Twitter. Just normal Twitter. Well, I, you know, there is a special special subsection of of normal Twitter that is where academics post things. And have you heard about this story? The story coming out of Michigan State. This just came out. I have earlier this week. You shared it with me. Yeah, and it's it's horrifying. It is. It is something else. So, for those of you that have not heard this story yet, in case you haven't noticed. There's been a pandemic going on, and as a part of this pandemic, a lot of people lost their jobs when a lot of the service industries started slowing down. Specifically, in this instance, I'm talking about the culinary services at Michigan State University and actually at many of the public universities in Michigan. So a lot of people lost their jobs, which sucks, obviously. And so now students are back on grounds, and now Michigan State has a lot of students back Mm -hmm. and uh, they even made a rule there that not only their first years, also their second years had to live on campus. Mm -hmm. So they have to, you know, staff up a lot and it turns out no one's coming back. And so they send out an email and I'm going to read you some snippets of it. So so what you mean is that a bunch of people who had service industry jobs didn't wait around on their hands doing nothing for a year and a half and instead got jobs doing other things. Why? (gasps) I never. I, how dare they? I mean, come on now. Yeah. So this email went out to some faculty, deans, directors, and chairs, as you know, like other schools and universities across the country, culinary services is experiencing severe staffing shortages. Many businesses in the local area and around the country are hiring They left out the part where it says our hiring and probably paying a lot better than we are. And we are all competing for the same available talent. Sign up to volunteer faculty and staff from around campus are invited to sign up to assist in dining halls. (sighs) Note, and this is in bold. We have specific needs for evenings and weekends. Yeah. And, and, And to be clear, the word volunteer there, it isn't just a sloppy verb. They literally mean work without pay. And there are so many amusing things about this. First off, could you imagine? Could you imagine? You give a test. A student is upset. It's the end of the day. They finish up the test. They're grumpy. And what what do they do? They decide, I'm going to go down to the student union, get me a burger. Who's back there slinging the burger for him? Well, it's <laughs> Professor McBurney and just serving I, that right I up to them. I have worked in fast food. I have some experience with flipping patties. And once they have picked up those burgers, they've taken them up to the cash register. Who's waiting by the register to swipe their car? It's Professor Sheriff. It's so nice to see you. Let me take your money. I'll see you tomorrow morning for the quiz. So that wouldn't be awkward at all. Yeah. Also, um, <laughs> if interested, please fill out this Qualtrics survey. For those people that don't know, Qualtrics is a high end research tool for doing survey research. So instead of saying fill out this Google form, whatever, we decided to leverage one of our major research tools for you to sign up because maybe that'll make you feel more comfortable, faculty members. But the next line is the best part. This is where you'll find a volunteer acknowledge form acknowledging that you were not coerced into doing this and how to get your criminal background check to and sign up for your first shift. So background check required for slinging burgers, but not, not, but not for being in the classroom. Yeah. 
Also, background check required to not get paid. Just, just putting that out there. Just to, I, I, th- th- don't get me wrong. I, you know, my, my wife is an elementary school librarian there. I mean, you know, they all have background checks in order to volunteer at public schools, background check. I think I all, all, all for it. I, I, I don't think that's the, that's the issue here. It's just, it's really interesting. And then of course the, the very end of the letter, thank you for helping culinary services maintain our commitment to high quality customer service. Yeah. Go green. Oh boy. Now, now I have done, I have done the uh, midnight pancake breakfast where, you know, some, the, the, the faculty go and they, they, they help prepare and they serve breakfast at midnight during exam week is like a fun thing for the students. I've done that before. And I thought that was, I'm actually not familiar with that. I'll have to be. I, they've actually. I, I don't. I well, don't think they've done it. Well, okay. Well, in fairness, to be clear, in the in fa- in, <laughs> been the, the, past the two years. spring semesters I've been here have not ended on grounds. So, I've I've Fair only enough. done one final exam in a UVA building. Well, two, but they were in the same semester. Yeah. It. It. Um. I think this one was back in 2000 and. Eight, I think. I think it's it's been quite a while. I think most of these events now take place, um, you know, outside during the day, right. pancakes for Parkinson's, that sort of thing. I don't know if they necessarily want us faculty here getting anywhere near the dining services. Right. Um, yeah. But, wow. I mean, wow. Of course, the immediate the immediate responses to this post are things like, Let's check that football coach's salary again. Um, should we be? <laughs> should maybe he maybe he can chip in a little bit of time. Maybe he can uh. he can add some of that. So um, they do point out that the the salaried staff that work for Residence Life at Michigan State are already pulling shifts. Right. Um, that they are just now reaching out to to everyone else. So the, uh, the other, grad the students, other really, I, 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 I would have to ask, uh, when I was asking my department chair for permission to do this, um, would this count as service or research, uh, <laughs> towards tenure? Um, because you know, th- there's, there is some quality social research you could do here, you know, pretend to spit in a burger and see what the response is. I'm sure that would be IRB approved. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Well, All right. from what from one dystopian nightmare to another, robots taking over the internet. Did you know that there's an entire subreddit, an entire subreddit that is only bots posting, bots trained by reading other subreddits? See, now the joke here is I read our Hearthstone, and I would argue that many of those are bots of people just arguing about why Hearthstone's not a fun game, mm-hmm. but. Uh, that joke only will land to, I think, one or maybe two people listening to this podcast. So, um, no, I did not. I, 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 I didn't know this. So is this something that was done by academics and they or that they you know decided to make bots to do this? Or is it just so it is? I, I don't fun? know if it's done by. So it specifically it uses the GPT uh, two model from open AI. So it's a language generation model. And I will say this, it actually produces readable sentences, not necessarily to say semantically meaningful sentences, but it it does produce sentences that have subject verbs and even can have complex things like prepositional phrase in that. And that's pretty impressive, uh, given hey, where natural language processing still is. So that's hey, they're, they're lapping me on some of the research papers I've written just right there. So go yeah. go bots. So with that. We have a question that the explain like I'm five bot asked because, frankly, I didn't like any of the human explain like I'm five questions this week. So we're just going to use a robot. (laughs) So even even questions on our 20 episode long podcast have been outsourced to robots is what you're telling me. Exactly. And this question, I think, raises a really good point. We're so desperate for listener questions. (laughs) Well, we have a couple coming up, but um, explain like I'm five. Okay. Why are there so many people who have a first name? Wait. Uh, the question follows. Okay. I know that most people have a first name, but I don't know much about the reasoning behind it. Is it just to identify them by name, or are there some other reasons? So this okay. <laughs> 
so there's a couple ways, of course, to interpret this. One of this is, you know, I am robot. Why do you need identifier <laughs> bag of mostly water? <laughs> you should be identified by your, you know, do I something have a like name? that. Oh, uh, yeah, it, it's robot. Do I have a soul? Like, just immediately <laughs> everyone gets uncomfortable. Uh, I have some responses here from some from from some fellow explain like I'm five bots. Um, I was once told that first names are the first name of the person and surnames are the last name of the person. So that's, I think, very helpful and insightful. That That is as helpful as most comments on Reddit. Yeah. Um, it's one of the first things you learn in school. When you're born, your name is assigned to you. For example, if you have a name like Jane Smith, then you are Jane Smith and you are a female with the first name Jane. In the future, you will want to identify yourself, comma, by using your first name. I don't know why. I, I just emphasized the comma there because it, it seemed odd. So, now, see, uh, oh, that... And I should also note, this is a tradition that goes back to when people who were illiterate used to write their first names on their doors. This is not really related to why there are so <laughs> many people with first names, though. That so, bot's so, making some assumptions. Yeah. Jane doesn't have to be a female name. Yeah. How do you know how this person identifies? Yeah. Jane is a dude in a Firefly, so there yeah. you go, right there. Um, yeah, so so robots, uh, here's here's a short one. First names have historical value. First names were used to identify the person and are a personal identifier. Second names were used to identify a person and were less personal since they were often used for work and such. Names became more for personal in the last such. few hundred years, but names were a personal identifier before that. So there we go. Wow, that just kind of goes. So did did a share or sting uh, uh, decide to post here? I, and you know we have a colleague who pu who publishes a lot in CS Education in Australia whose name is Simon. That's that's it. That's it. It's Simon. And on his papers, like his official papers in the ACM Digital Library, it says Simon from Australia because apparently he is the representative Simon. Yeah. <laughs> there is. So is, it, is, that, yeah. is that his first name or is that just a name? Somewhat related. If you there is, if you only have one name, is it your first name? Um, I mean, yes. I mean, like, hmm. if if I only have one student in the class, they both have the highest and lowest grade in the class. So, yeah, wouldn't that be nice? A class with one student. Anyway, no. Uh, I should note there is actually a Paul W. McBurney that is not me that has published papers. I think in like oh. Signal stuff out in the Pacific Southwest. And one of my papers got assigned to them at one point, and that was awkward. Because they, like, I've never communicated with this individual, just they literally publish their papers, Paul W. McBurney, and that's what I do, because I go by my middle name, Will, so the W is just to signify, hey, I yeah. go by my middle name. But yeah. Anyway, so that is, that is the robot question. If I see funny ones, I will bring them up. Um, by the way, there are numbers of posts on this, uh, on this subreddit that ask, are we in a simulation? And then those ones can get fun. I'm sure they can. I'm not letting go of this name window. I'm just still just kind of ruminating on this on my head. It's like it. Why? Why? Why is it a first name? And of course, in you know, in in, in Japanese culture, you would you know, even your friends, you just refer to them by their last name, right? Be well, um, because their last name is their personal name, and their first name is their family name. That's oh well, no, okay. Well, what I meant was you you are correct in what I was saying there, but I, but you know, if you're referring to someone who is um. I'm only thinking of anime characters now. Izuku Midoriya, you refer to them as Midoriya, with Midoriya being the family name. And you'd only call them Izuku if you, or Izuku kun if you were very familiar with the person. Right. 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 Ah. Okay. Well, that was cool. All right. Um, we, have we, have our a, we have a question from a, from a uh, organism, we'll say. An organism. <laughs> That's no way to talk about my father. So, <laughs> wait, you sh you're saying your father's not an organism? Okay, okay, I guess he is, but that's not that's not something I typically put on like his birthday card. Um, happy birthday, organism. Um, our second listener question does come does come from my dad. We'll call him. Well, we'll call him what we call him. Pop, Pop Sheriff, Pop Sheriff. Uh, writes in and and asks very simply. I read something about. Right to repair. What do you think about that? And that just kind of was, was where it was left. And that's still a good place to, to a good thing for us to talk about. Because right to repair certainly is something that is important for those of us that buy a lot of gadgets. I mean, sitting in front yep. of me right now, I've got 
a tablet, I've got my MacBook, I've got an iPhone, I've got a Switch, I've got multiple controllers, mm-hmm. video game systems, monitors. Like, I have a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think first we have to figure out, well, what does it mean to have the right to repair? Because it sounds pretty obvious. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I own a thing. I should have the ability to do it. But this is actually not limited to just um, electronics, even though that's kind of where uh, the one of the big pushes is, is, is right. in electronics. But this is also an issue for things like cars. Mm-hmm. It's also a things for and if you actually look at some of um, the current administration's uh, phrasing about right to repair, they talk about things like tractors um, because why not? I mean, right. that, you know, that, that's a more broadly understandable sort of thing. And it, it boils down to the to four core objectives that uh, right to repair activists are going for. First off, number one is making information available. Everyone should have access to the manuals and schematics and the basic software updates of a of a device. Right. So when you create a device, you should. The, 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 the creator should produce some form of schematics to say, this is how we put it together. Mm-hmm. So you have a better understanding of how to go in and, you know, take, take it apart or, right. or make adjustments to it. These are typically done in at least the electronics world. Uh, we have like, I fix it and mm-hmm. uh, services like that who will actually go in and do teardowns and show you how they teared it down and show you where the, the tough parts are getting about. So that's the first part. Now, the second part is making the parts and tools available. So if you have any custom diagnostic tools or physical tools for getting into a device, those should be made available. So perhaps you have a set of screws that have a just a crazy pants, you know, it's not it ain't a Phillips head. It ain't a star screw. It's it's something that is rather difficult to get into or has a lock on some right. some part of it. Or um on cars in particular, if you have a, a unit in the vehicle that will tell you, oh, yeah, seven white beeps means this is why the check engine light is on and you can just plug it in. It just gives you the readout. Right. Make that available. So that's two. Yeah. The and third and I, is- I should note there uh, that's something where like the computer they have, like they intentionally don't like want you to know what's wrong with your car because then they can charge you to have the computer readout anyway. We'll get into yeah, that, but th- that's exactly we'll what we're going to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the third part is allowing unlocking, which is this is the ability to, mm-hmm. uh, if a device is running a particular piece of software, a particular operating system, you have the right to go in and flash it with a different piece of, of software. And this is important for devices that are older and that there might not be new software updates for mm-hmm. from the company because it's not in their financial benefit to continue updating that device, but a uh, community might update the device on their own with specialized software for a specific purpose. We saw this a lot with certain types of routers, actually mm-hmm. older routers that you want to turn into something uh, new. And the final part, part number four is when companies are creating things that they are building the items with specifically repairability in mind. Right. So you're not gluing things together with, mm-hmm super glue that you can never put back together or yada, yada, yada. So, you know, on on one side of the argument is the right to repair advocates that basically say these four things, these are things that we should be either legislating or striving toward so that when people spend good money on a complex device, they don't have to pay a premium, a monopoly-esque premium Mm -hmm. to go to the the manufacturer to have something repaired that there can be either do it yourself repair or third party companies that can compete with them mm-hmm. to then either use OEM parts uh, or, um, or even, you know, aftermarket parts. Right. And of course, on the other side, the manufacturers, well, yes, they want to make money. So yes, it's in their interest to keep things locked down. So there's that cynical reason right. they certainly want to do it. And there's, uh, there's play- plenty of examples of that cynical reason. That, that, yes, that there I'll, are. I'll present yeah. a couple. Yes. And uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll play one more thing and then I want to toss it to you. But the let's say the more devil's advocate reasonable arguments from the manufacturer side, um, there are IP concerns, intellectual property concerns, yep. because depending on if they've used any sort of very proprietary methodology for manufacturing the device or the software used for it, if it was 
Uh, you know, this could be a way that company secrets could be, you know, leaked in some way. Um, and that's actually probably the only one that I find the, the compelling in any way, because I that's, think that, 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 yeah, that is, that's at least not that, cynical. That is at least not cynical. I think that's reasonable. I, they, the, the other argument that they make that I think is just in bad faith is that it's a security risk. Mm-hmm. And honestly, if you are putting out a device and you are selling it to people and your security is please don't take it apart. That's bad security. I mean, the security, right. <laughs> the security needs to be built in in the software itself. So yeah. I think that's a bad faith argument. But the IP concern, I think that's from a business perspective, that is legitimate. So, um, you know, part of me, I look at this and I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I could get behind a lot of these. I don't know if I'm as fervent behind it as as certainly some of the major advocates, mm-hmm. um, because I have had a third party repair done to my iPhone and uh, an older iPhone and I was not pleased with it. I right. felt like I was paying for for a a lower end um, solution. So, uh, what what are your thoughts? What have you uh, experienced with this? So, I, I do take kind of a more cynical angle to this uh, because I I generally tend to be more of a you know like yeah, there's the right of first sale, but then at that point, like it, it's out of your like you've already made money selling the product. So the, the 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 worst example of this by far is programming a key fob for a car. Um, hmm. It is very often it's like a process, you know, especially earlier on. I, it more and more now with cars having computers in them, you're seeing a lot where now you actually have to connect like the key to a special computer that connects to the car because they found that people are finding the tricks out. But like. We had a Honda Accord, and apparently the way that you program the key was you put it in the ignition. Uh, it still had to be cut right to turn, but the way you program it was like you put it in the ignition, put it in the on position, flick the headlights twice, open the door, close the door, flick the headlights twice, headlights twice. And it's just like, it's a secret, like, Konami code to just program, <laughs> you know, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, beer, to program it. And if you go to the and dealership you got to lives. do it, they'll charge you, like, $30 for it. Like... Or like not not there. They'll charge you literally like three hundred dollars for it. There's like oh the key oh well this is a hundred dollar key. It's like a two dollar key. Oh because it has it has a chip in it and the programming. Well it's a very involved process. They do that. They, they'll charge you three hundred dollars for it because you don't have a choice because they're the only ones who know how to do it until someone figures it out. Um and then once someone figures it out then they'll put a YouTube video up and you know the next year they change the way to do it. So that's that's absolutely just a way for dealerships to make money. There's a ton of problems with car dealerships in general. We could do a question on that later. Just my issue with them. Um, to your iPhone point, this is where I take the view on right of repair that you have a right uh, to go to a third party for repair if you're willing to trust that third party. And if you're dissatisfied mm. with that, that's your own fault. But, oh, thanks. But no, no, no. But what I mean by that is, <laughs> let's compare that to what Apple does now. Um, it, it, I have seen stories of this. Granted, I don't have Apple products, but I've seen stories where people have gotten the screen replaced on their iPhone, and rather than pay like the huge, huge fee for the digitizer screen mm-hmm. at Apple, they get basically an equivalent digitizer screen at a third party. Well, like iPhones are deter- are recognized now. Like, oh, that's not the digitizer that is officially Apple sponsored. Oh, I detect that. Okay. I'm going to brick your phone and I'm going to leave a message up saying, Hey, your phone window is not the right brand. It's not Apple brand. So I'm just not going to let you do that. That is, you have to go to Apple and pay them Apple and Apple store money to fix your phone. That's intentionally designed to try to monopolize. I fix it out of the market or things like that. And I'm just generally against anti-competitive practices like that. I mean, it's hard to argue with anything you just said. I mean, mm-hmm. um, I think it's just a lot of anti-competitive practice. And I, generally, I mean, if you know, I, I am actually a, a pro free market guy, but you have to allow for competition in the marketplace. And so right. I do think this any type of legislation that that is in the right of repair in this context, I would consider basically anti-monopoly legislation in a lot of mm. ways. That said, the, and you the, then have the right to get a bad repair as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, 
I, the, the way that the legislation seems to be working nowadays uh, in this realm is not even at the federal level. Right. It tends to be happening more at a state will pass something mm-hmm. or a, and then a, a neighboring state will pass something similar. And basically what happens is, is the manufacturer says, well, I can't build one thing just for Massachusetts. So let's, you know, OK, it'll just become the de facto way that we do it. And so this is the Massachusetts did pass a car repair law. A right to repair law that did have effects nationwide for the publication mm-hmm. of some of the diagnostic tools and things like that. So it's possible we might see something like that in some state legislatures. Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, the thing is, is that the legislatures that I would argue are probably most likely to do something like that are also the legislatures where some of these tech companies are. Yeah, California, in the same st- <laughs> and, and, and That's Washington. Exactly, yeah, California, and Washington. Those, those. Those immediate come by, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not expecting you know the Florida state legislature to come do yeah. something like this, yeah. Um, even though it is a, a an anti monopoly sort of thing. So anyway, and and, um, and this is how you end up with a seven hundred dollar juicer where the juice packet, the premium juice packets, you have to buy strictly from them with a QR code to make sure you're only using their juice packets can be easily just you take the packet and you just squeeze it by hand and it's completely fine. It's juice. Didn't we talk about Keurigs with QR codes? I, feel yeah, I like think we, we did. did at one point. I can't remember the name well, we, of the juicer. It, it thankfully didn't catch on because it's just kind of. Let me try to remember it. Uh, juicer. It was. Oh, nothing's more Juicero. fun than editing out. Juicero. Nothing. Oh, okay. Nothing's more fun than editing it out. Keyboard yeah. sounds. Sorry I about probably that. Probably won't though. Juicero. <laughs> it is like the height of Silicon Valley excess. If you want to look up a story on that, Juicero. Juicero. I think I think that was my one of my main fighters in Street Fighter yeah. 2 back in the day. So, all right. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Pop. Love you, Pop. Love you, Mom. So, you know, our, 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 our faithful listeners. All right. You got another question for us, Will? I well, not really. Quite, uh, here, I'll frame it this way. Did you know that uh, a professor at Cornell proved that humans have ESP? Whoa. Really? Yeah. Yeah, so that, uh so I, I by ESP you do mean extrasensory perception, yes. right? Yes. Whoa. So what the what the uh what the I will explain the experiment design. And the experiment design was that basically people were put uh into a room looking at a you know, two areas, a left side and a right side, both covered with curtains, and then a picture would be displayed randomly on one of the two monitors, and the person had to guess which screen had the picture and they did uh and they they didn't find esp with two of the types so they did like just normal pictures i think it was like landscapes or portraits i can't remember which then they did like scary pictures like spiders and stuff and, and neither of those like the person reasonably predict but when they used erotic images people predicted uh the the picture 53 percent of the time so wait, so they had to guess what was the picture? They had to no, they had to guess which side the picture was on. So the idea of a is single that monitor they, or... the monitor would the there's a curtain in front of the monitor. There's two monitors, okay. left and right. Yeah. There's yeah. curtains in front of both. You guess the which side the picture's behind, the curtains reveal, and it will show you which it is. And this this would the image would <laughs> show me be porn, there. show me porn. Right. Woo, it opens so, up. The the <laughs> wait, it, okay, no, no, hey, 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 hey. Was it one I, I just want clarification. It was one like widescreen monitor, right? Wide I think screen it was mo- two was... monitors. I don't I don't See, know that. I could do details. that though, because I because if an L C D panel kicks on, I can hear that. Right. No, no, no. Both monitors would be on. One would just have a picture, the other would be blank. I still think I could hear it, but but well, maybe you could, and maybe that explains maybe the result. Maybe ESP. Because maybe that's what we're coming to here. What okay, they found anyway. was that 53% of the time, um, people were predicting. And while that doesn't sound like much, it was statistically significant, P less than 0.05. And this brings me to the actual question I'm going to ask, which is, based on this experiment, it's kind of a good jumping off point for why is most published research probably wrong? And and this is this is the problem. So for example, um, right now, my wife and I are trying to get pregnant, and a story just came out, and it said acetaminophen has been linked to ADD in children. And after ha- and this was right after I had read the why most published research is wrong, and I do not know if I can believe the study now. And I'm going to walk through why. So first, 
Um, I do want to read a... So there was a lot of criticism about this study, right? Because humans okay. don't have ESP. They, the, the idea Aww. was that somehow people are getting erotic tachyons from the future telling them what picture <laughs> it is, I guess. No, but the idea was that somehow people I are think we have our the episode future title now. Um, yeah. Erotic tachyons <laughs> in the future. No. So, yeah. so um, he, there were... So immediately, people said, okay, this is a pretty extraordinary study. It got covered on CNN, MSNBC, you know, guy went on a tour, tons of newspapers covered it. So this was a big deal when it came out. Like, this is like, oh my god, can you believe, like, what if humans do have some untapped ESP resource? So, got a huge amount of coverage. Immediately, and the paper, by the way, is called Feeling the Future, if you want to look it up. Uh, and it was published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, which, to be clear, is a respectable journal. It has, like, an impact factor, like, six or seven. Which oh, is okay. Which is a respectable journal. This is not this is not some pay for play it's predatory. Not, it's journal. not a boondoggle, right? Right. So, um, guy does a media tour, and immediately people start saying, "Okay, let's start trying to replicate this study." And they immediately ran into a problem. Nobody would publish the replication studies, so people would do replication studies, not find the same result, and they went to the same journal, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. And they refuse to publish it because the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology doesn't publish replication studies. What? Here, well, let's think of it like this. Now let's bring this home to our problems. ICSI, International Conference of Software Engineering. How many replication studies typically get published there? So, okay, so you're, okay, well, okay, uh, outside of ICSI, so I'm not going to get, I'm not going right. to get that deep into that one, but if we're going to talk about computer science education stuff, um, my research, literally my research is in the current state of empiricism and replication in CS education research. Mm -hmm. I have a grant to study this yep. because we, we have a problem. And, and so, I mean, the way it happens in computer science education, I mean, we're not, we're not putting up erotic images and saying, students, right. where is your test? No, we're doing things like, um, <laughs> no, the problem is, is that a teacher thinks of something cool. Mm -hmm. They do it in the classroom. They write it up. Look, I did this cool thing. And then everyone looks at it and says, Hey, that was cool. And then everyone goes about their lives. We don't necessarily take a cool I mean, certainly some do, but mm -hmm. a lot of the pedagogical techniques that, that people come up with aren't necessarily applied. OK, this worked at a you know mid-level R1 university. Have we tried it at a small liberal arts college? Have we tried it right. with, with mostly, you know, first time, first time college students, first time in, in the family? So, you know, do we see a lot of replication in CS education? No. Do we have we started emphasizing more the need for replication studies? Yes. Yes, absolutely. We have because this is how th this is how you determine whether that first shot was actually uh, to be clear. Let, let, let's actually give a, a definition of what a replication study is. So it, if you do a a research study, remember a good good scientific method, you keep everything the same except one thing and you change that one thing in some way. If you're trying to do a standard A-B comparison sort of sort of research, study. there's other types of research studies to do. But let's just take that one as an example. You take that, you take that methodology, you take whatever instrument that is used. So it could be a survey. It could be some sort of mechanism. It could be pornography on monitors, apparently, with the, the right type of screen to hide behind it. Um, and you do the exact same thing with a different set mm -hmm. of subjects. And what's really important is you're doing it with a different researcher because researchers have bias. Yes. Period. A researcher and who does not have an incentive for this for the null hypothesis to be rejected. That is for their belief or for the experiment to suggest that ESP is, tr is true. Right. Exactly. And it's, I'm not saying that researchers are intentionally biased, mm -hmm. but well, potentially particularly, well, particularly with, okay, well, particularly with teachers, I do something cool. I want my students to learn better. You yeah. know, I, I, I thought of this cool new thing to do. Of course I want it to work, you know, but the real test of that is I teach another teacher how to do it. Mm -hmm. They apply it in their classroom. They don't give two flying flips, whether, you know, what it means to me, they right. just want their students to learn too. So, so this, so, so what you're talking about there is the replication crisis. And this is, 
a larger scale problem, not in computer science, not in STEM, just all of like published work is this this replication crisis. Oh, uh, well, so like even when we get into psychology and so psychology, it's there when we get into medicine, it's there. And so, for example, and, and, and I, I kind of just want to resume real quick going back to. Um, sure, so, yeah. so the journals, the, the specific journal that published it refused to publish replication studies um, that went against it. Uh, further, a fourth journal, and I'm and I'm going from an article here. Uh, the fourth journal, the British Journal of Psychology, refused to publish a replication study that went against the findings after the reservations of one of the referees. The referee was the author of the, the original of the... paper. Oh no! So this is why, whenever like, so I, I've actually had to review papers that were critical of my work. I always try to just not address criticism of my work in that review as best as I can because yeah I, I'm gonna be I want to protect my work because I, I spent a lot of time on it but you know this is one issue of peer review you may be criticizing the ideas of someone who has an incentive to not have their ideas criticized or you know just a natural human desire so so this is where we get into um, the biggest problem of the replication crisis is that it's there's a lot of positive feedback mechanics here. First, we need to talk about just kind of a discrete math idea, and I'm going to keep the math as simple as possible. Please. If you say, uh, let's say there's a, a medical test for disease X that is 98% accurate, and you test positive, what are the odds that you have the disease? It's 100%? Not, no, it's not, it's not 100%. It's not 98%. It depends, is the answer. Okay. If the disease is... I thought it was a, I, I, this was a trick question. I just didn't know yeah, where no, it was it going. Is. So if the disease is fairly common, let's say, like, 1 in 10 people have it, you know, something like COVID, then that's a pretty high probability, a 98% accurate test. A yes, of, a yes is a true positive. Oh, However, this, oh, this is the argument. If okay. you have something that's exceedingly rare, something that maybe is only present in one in ten million people, and a test is ninety-eight percent accurate, if you test positive just because of how rare the disease is, it is still far more likely that that po po uh, that positive is a false positive than it is a true positive. Or I don't want to say far more likely. It is more likely that you get a positive result that is. Uh, false, that you're not right. actually sick, but it tests positive. So you need to test multiple times, for example, to to increase that probability, that likelihood that you're not getting false positive. Right. So this is why we do replication studies. But understand that an experiment is more likely to give a false positive if the underlying um, condition is more rare or is more unlikely. That is, the underlying mm -hmm. hypothesis mm -hmm. is less likely to be true. You're more likely to get a false positive result. And this is not a small problem. For context, um, in 53 preclinical cancer studies that were, uh, that were examined uh, at the University of Texas, 11% could be replicated. Uh, in a study of 49 medical studies with more than 1,000 citations between 1990 and 2003, of the studies that were examined, 16% were contradicted, 16% had a stronger effect than the subsequent studies, 44% were regulated, 24 remained largely unchallenged. So, there's a lot of studies that, even in the medical field, where you think, oh, there's this high standard, where they're not, they can't be replicated. Uh, okay, but clearly in something really hardcore like physics, this could never go wrong, right? There's the pentaquark. There were multiple papers mm. published about the discovery of the pentaquark. So subatomic particles are made of three quarks, right? A pentaquark would be five. So, hey, that's weird. Okay. But they found this pentaquark with a, with a likelihood P.00000001. That that's said, a small P. it's still not true. Uh, it's it's still not it, it there there is no pentaquark there was no evidence for pentaquark can't be replicated didn't happen so this infects all of science and at root is these positive feedback mechanics one 
Uh, in in pr- research, professors are generally in a publisher parish setting. True. We need to get articles published. We need to get them published quickly, early in our careers. And they and so 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 how do we get things published? Well, if you have a null result, if you look at papers that are published, very few of them are null results. Which is null results meaning that. Um, we did not find anything. We significant. did not find anything su- significant to report. So, like for example, oh, we tested if um, this drug helped fight COVID, and it did not. That's the null hypothesis. Uh, as opposed to if you found a positive uh, correlation that the drug helped, it would be uh, it would be rejecting the null hypothesis. So, so studies that do not reject the null hypothesis are less likely to get published because that they're they're boring. True. Also, studies that um, are that are more eye-catching, you know, like, hey, what if humans have ESP and can see into the future? Well, that study's, you know, going to get some headlines. That's going to draw a lot of interest and citations. So, hey, let's publish that. So, so we encourage trying to find, and then you can do things like p-hacking, not even intentionally. P-hacking just basically modify the experiment data set, modify the parameters, whatever, until you find the magic P less than 0.05, a.k.a. published result. You can do that unintentionally, completely unintentionally. In good faith. Subconsciously, even. Yeah, subconsciously, and and acting in what you truly believe is good faith, and you can still end up with a P-hacked result. And what you end up with is a system that encourages publishing papers, whether right or wrong, because here's the thing. What if you publish a wrong paper, a paper that gives incorrect insight? Well, it just gets more citations. So, hey, that helps your... That helps your they can, that's a bit simple. They can know, be recalled. They, they, can, they be recalled. can be recalled. They can be. But, but it's fairly rare that they are. Even when a result is contradicted by replications, it's fairly rare. But it depends upon... Okay, so, I mean... I, I think that one thing I, I don't want to shake the faith in science in general, right. because no, no, no. obviously, I, I, but I mean, I, th- I think it's important to also point out that um, science is messy. Yes. And that, you know, when we are when we are engaging in the scientific method, humans, period, are a threat to validity yeah. just in general. And so, yes, our some of our methodologies in working through some of these replications for things that. I mean, let's be honest. The replication of the ESP with the the, the 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 criticality of that research is is low. In general, it's relatively low, right? Well, but but the, here's where I have no, to disagree. No, 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 with hey, you. no hang. I'll, I'll, all right, I'll come back to my disagreement with that. Okay, okay. I, it, it's a moot. It's 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 a throwaway point. What I wanted to get to though was if we look at like some of the stuff that's been going on over dur- during this, you know, the general uh, uh, unease, the unpleasantness that is uh, around the world uh, with with COVID. You know, humanity is seeing science at work in a way yes. that they have never seen before, which is. You know, we can't do one study, have the answer, and then this is what happens. And right. we saw this with things like masking, with 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 guidance for masking. At the beginning, we were saying you shouldn't mask because we need the masks just for people that are on the front lines, and that and mm-hmm. it was more for protecting your others. And now it does help protect you because more studies have happened, yes. and some of them are replication, and yes. some of them are finding things, and it's. As we increase the amount of work in the area and we see all the different variables that are being tested in different environments, it is we are able to make more science, more reasonably understood scientific yes. decisions. Um, and so this is a feature, not a bug. Correct. But I, I completely there agree. are a lot. of. But we know that there are a lot of bugs in the process, as you have just explained. Yes. There so, are a lot of bugs in the process. And most of those bugs are us. Yes. So I, I want to be completely clear. This is not some like anti-science scree, obviously, because I I have a PhD. I've I, I I care about the process. What what I what I am more addressing is I'm worried about incentives in the system, and and I will say that this is getting better, and and we're starting to recognize some of the bad incentives, like not publishing replication studies, because those are very vital, as we've learned with the COVID masking, for example. Replication studies are vital. Data, this is where it gets controversial. Data doesn't speak for itself. It has to be interpreted. 
It has to be interpreted to get to mm -hmm. insight. Yeah. Because yeah. what we're doing with the scientific process to generate insights is we're designing experiments that produce data that we then try to interpret into knowledge, which can be wrong. I mean, that's, the scientific method does not guarantee that your interpretations of data will be correct. They ju it just tends to get better the more you replicate the experiment. This is why we like large sample sizes, for example. So I am not saying instinctively distrust all published research. What I am saying is when you have these big headline-grabbing articles like, did you know that eating a chocolate bar a day can help you lose weight? <gasps> Understand that there was actually an experiment that actually produced P less than 0.05 there. But that experiment, which is real, that did produce that result, was intentionally designed to produce a headline-grabbing result. It was not, not, mm. not nefariously, but more to point out bigger issues with computer science publications. Or not computer science publication. Uh, uh, like, uh, sorry. How do I Nut do that? Nutritional science, research. nutritional science publication. Oh, dang where it. Big, surprising results. Oh, this thing that you don't think should happen should happen. That's going to get headlines and draw a lot of media attention. Like, oh, humans have ESP. And then the follow-up that suggests that's not true, that corrects this misinformation, has to work dramatically harder and has to um, has to find a voice and a place when media can be hostile to that. Media not just being television, but also even these journals that don't accept replication studies. And my point here is this gets to a deeper problem of misinformation because um, mm. it doesn't it doesn't have to be intentional misinformation. And what I worry is that we've set up a system that encourages rapid fire surprising hypotheses. Going back to what I said earlier, the more rare the disease is, the more likely you have a false positive. The more unlikely the hypothesis you test, the more likely the false positive. Yeah. This, so so this, is, this is why I'm saying if you see an article that says a, stu a study, one, says that X causes Y, d doesn't mean that that's wrong. Just generally actually take time to read the article and don't trust the headline and look at things like the sample size and look at things like have replications been attempted? Yeah, so that that's to be clear. Science is not a perfect tool. It's the best one we got. Um, it's gotten us pretty far. It's done amazing things, especially with the vaccine, it's done amazing things and just look at, you know, 100 years ago. About 40% of the Western world worked in agriculture. Now it's like two, yet there's less starvation. You know, that's technology and science. So it, it's the best tool we have, but that doesn't mean that every article published is producing a, an accurate insight that should be treated as gospel. I think you just described my last few papers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, uh, we've been going long. First off, thank you for for holding down the fort uh, yeah. last week. I, I needed an extension, apparently. <laughs> um, but, but even in previous weeks, we've been going long. So I've got it. I have another longer one that's queued up. But I think I'll hold that for next yeah. week. And instead, instead, I just want to give you a question that was posted on the professor subreddit. We'll talk about this one just for a minute before we before we wrap it up. The question is, how do you write a bad letter of recommendation. I have a previous student who, despite me telling him multiple times I would not be able to write him a strong letter, has submitted me as a reference for an intensive PhD program. More specifically, I told the student exactly why he should not put me down. He skipped multiple classes, refused to write the papers, failed numerous courses, refused to meet me for advising, stopped responding to advising emails, transferred to an online degree in order to eventually graduate. I've never had to write a poor letter of recommendation, but I'm required to submit something. What do I do? I mean, just just that is fine. <laughs> just look, you already have your draft on Reddit. Like, let's check it for grammar, copy and paste. <laughs> I mean, this is this is difficult. Um not to get too deep in the weeds, but I'm sure you get this happening, you sheriff. I get it. 
a student comes into my office. They say, hey, you know, I'm applying for this program for study abroad or this internship or whatever. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And they'll say, great, so you'll write me a letter of recommendation, right? I'm like, oh, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> you were in my class? To, to be clear, part of that is I have 120 people in, uh, in, in a section, or I have 150 people in a section this semester. It's a lot of names to learn, and uh, especially when I didn't recognize the individual. Uh, so I have, I, I've only had three types of letters I've had to affect mm -hmm. write. There's, there's the letter where it's, this person was a TA, mm -hmm. I worked with them, I will write them, you know, glow it. Like, yeah. if this was a TA for me and they did a good job and they prevented me from having to grade a bunch of tests and they did an excellent job, I will go to any length to write yes, them a beautiful exactly. letter. That, absolutely. Then there's a student that messaged me and says, hey, I was in your 3240 class two years, two semesters ago. I need a letter. And I'm like, look, you're in the class. I never talked to you. You got an A. That's nice. And they say, look, it just says I have to submit some letter. I didn't work with anyone. It's just for like a master's mm -hmm. program. What can you do? And I'll say, I can write you a one paragraph letter that confirms you're in the class and says, I looked at your work. It looked good. Go on with your life. And for many students, they say, yeah, that's all I really need. Right. Then I have had the student come in and say, will you, you know, I need, will you write me this letter? And I've had to say to the, say to their face, it would be in your best interest to choose a different person to write the letter Correct. because I do not believe that I'm going to write anything that is going to help you. Yes. And they did not make me do it. So this, so, um, so this student, so from what I gather, this seems like it's a student who didn't show effective communication skills, didn't complete things on time, and uh, wasn't in touch with the class. And my guess is the student emailed the professor saying, hey, I'm going to make you a recommender, and didn't read the reply, <laughs> if I had to it's guess. It's possible. <laughs> Uh, the other, the other, uh, uh, just uh, um, chef's kiss part of this this letter is after the professor's name was submitted, they didn't submit the recommendation for a while because it's like really I don't have to do this. The student emailed them and told them this was their last warning, and they had to get the letter in in the next three days. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> just the cherry on top of that one. Uh, and, and the 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 responses, of course, through the thread are you know. Um, are are just beautiful, but the best one, the best one is just make sure you put in the recommendation letter is with a lot of time, attention, and patience. I believe this student may be able to succeed in your program, and just watch how quickly they are not accepted. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, um, uh, I, 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 I've he, had I have had students come into my office, like, and this happened. Uh, where I was teaching, and the, stu the, the student came in, and they had been in my intro programming class two years ago, and they didn't remind them. And this happened twice, and it was the same semester for the same program. Two students walked in and said, I need you to write a letter of recommendation. It's due Friday. And it was like Wednesday <laughs> yeah. when they told me. And I'm like, who are you? And they're like, well, and, and one of them, when I said, no, I can't do that in that time, I can't write a, a strong letter of recommendation for you in that time, they said, but I need it for this program. And I'm like, well, then you need to find someone who can either better recommend you or you need to give me more time. <laughs> those are those are the choices. So I, yeah. if you're asking someone for a letter of recommendation, one, try to actually know them and hope they know you. Two, give them more than a, a, like a week or longer. In my case, it would help. <gasps> Oh, my favorite is when I never get asked. I just yeah. call, I get cold called and they said, oh, yeah, such and such turned in your name. What can you know? tell me about them? Well, I can tell you they don't like to ask permission before they do things. <laughs> that, that usually goes over well yeah. with the recruiter when I say that one. Actually, have you gotten a lot of these yet? Because at, at being at the University of Virginia, we are very close to D.C. and there are a lot of government yes, contractors I have, there. I have gotten the, uh, the is this person an enemy of the state call? Yes, yeah. uh, the, the, the investigators come and I love it because I've done so many of these. I know their questions and now it freaks them out because I say, no, I don't know if they've had any foreign travel. No, I do not know <laughs> if anyone has any influence over them. No, I do know. I do not know what they do on the weekends with, you know, alcohol. They're like, how do you know all these questions? Like, dude, I have I've been down this path. Yeah. And then every once in a while, they'll ask me a question like, 
do you know if they have any children that they have not reported to the government? And I'm like, wait, how am I supposed to know about information that's unknowable? Yeah, that we're this literally is not even allowed to ask about, for that matter. Exactly. I, um, I, I was asked that one just like a month ago, and I stopped and just had a conversation with the investigator for about 10 minutes about this one question. Like, why, why would I even have to? How? Yeah. The the anyway. one so this is actually one that did happen. Uh, this was during the COVID pandemic. Uh, one of my TAs apparently had had a had a background check, but somehow they couldn't find my phone number. So they called the office and left a voicemail, which I you know admittedly didn't check. But then they apparently left a, like a door hanger on my door because I yeah. came back months later and it was there. Just they, I saw that. But then they called my mother. <laughs> so. So, I mean, like, my mother, you can find her information because she's an employee of, of, of a state. I'm keeping it vague because I don't want, you know, something weird happening. But they somehow Ukraine. got a hold of my mother's phone number and called her. And I think it's because they had, because I actually have, ch I have changed cell phone numbers in my life. I think it's because they somehow had a record of my old cell phone number, but not my new one. So they had to get, so my mom had to give the person my new phone number and that was how they got in contact with me they, so they were persistent about this wow yeah wow yeah just so they could ask you if that ta had you know what their if what that their... ta was an enemy of the state to which i had to say probably not no oh, yeah well they, you know do you have any reason to believe that they have any ill will intentions to the united states of america no do they have any friends who are foreign nationals? Like, they're in computer science. We have lots of yeah. people who are foreign nationals. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Anyway, we are we are running long. Hang on, hang on. I think I have some ESP where uh, you're going with this. Oh, God. Are you, are you, are you going to say watch for falling goats here in a bit? Please do not tell me what you have on your monitor right now. That's, that's all I want to know. I, no, it's all I don't want to know. I, 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 have, I have a Discord and Audacity on my monitor and Reddit. Well, but the previous yeah, I know, study, I know, I know, I know. Okay, all right. Thank you so much for spending this last hour with us. We know that your time is precious, and you could spend your podcast time with so many other different, more uh, handsome and exciting and funny people. But you somehow decided to spend it with us, and that just warms our hearts greatly. If you have not had the opportunity to subscribe to the podcast, please head on over to Apple Podcasts, or you can find us at regradequest.com where you'll find links to all the different services that you can find this beautiful MP3 file that will fly through the internet onto your device of choice. If you have a moment to leave a review at Apple Podcasts or anywhere else where you can find the episode, that would really help it uh, because we haven't gotten a review yet. I mean, we've gotten two questions now. You know, th these numbers are going up. Someday we'll get our first review. And we've gotten some five stars. Those of you that have gone into Apple Podcasts and left five stars, that's super nice of you. We do appreciate it. Feels good. Feels good. Feels even better than some of the uh, the uh, course evaluations that we've gotten. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. If you have a question for us, you can go to regradequest.com. You can record an audio message that we will play on the podcast where we will then answer your question just as professionally as we have done over this past hour, or you're welcome to email us, or you can email my parents and they'll get it to us too. Or you can apparently call Will's mom and that will get <laughs> us to us as well. So for myself oh my and for Professor Will and Bernie, <laughs> take care, stay safe, and watch for falling goats. I told you he was going to say it. We can publish the result now. Oh, oh wait, less than zero, 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 one.